So welcome everybody. This is the Geislich Palette Free pre-party as a, I guess a preview, so to speak, of the Geislich and U2 uh, virtual symposium that is taking place live on February 2nd, uh, starting after this, uh, this conversation, but also will be recorded. And so both this conversation and the events and the activities of Geislich and U will be available to you on demand at a short time thereafter. So before I get to introducing doc, our featured speaker, Dr. Vinay Bidet, um, I'd like to actually uh, mention to everybody that you can use the chat function. We have people that are close by looking at the conversation and will be able to ask us some of the conversations as we go along. So with no further ado, let me introduce our featured speaker, Vinay Bidet. Uh, Dr. Bidet is a board certified periodontist with a specialty in periodontal plastics and reconstructive surgical procedures. Did his dental and specialty training at the University of Toronto, private practice in Toronto, and is a clinical instructor at the Department of Periodontics at the University of Toronto. And is a staff periodontist in the Center for Advanced Dental Care research at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. So without any further ado, I would like to say welcome, Dr. Bidet. Thank you for having me, Ron and Geislick team. And, you know, this is an exciting opportunity for us because, uh, you know, we've never really done a pre-show or a conversation with one of the featured speakers of the main event. So, you know, besides having some casual conversation, really the purpose of this is also to give a little bit of a, a little bit of a backstory, perhaps a little bit of an understanding of the clinical cases and a little bit of your practice mindset and philosophy. So as we look at the next slide, I don't think that this is what Toronto looks like today. My guess is it's a little, maybe a little whiter, maybe a little snowier, perhaps. Correct. But uh, can you tell us just a little bit about you know where your practice is in vicinity of Toronto? And I actually wanted to. Uh, utilize a fun fact for those of you that are asking about the glorious city of Toronto. It is considered somewhere between the sixth to eighth largest city in North America. Number one is Mexico City, and Toronto probably falls somewhere in the neighborhood of what, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, those metropolitan areas. So you're talking about a, a very, very large metropolitan area. So Dr. Bidet, could you talk really quickly about you know where your practice is and specialty demographics. Absolutely. So once again, Ron, thanks for thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I've been actually looking more forward to this than the actual Congress uh, <laughs> itself. Um, so Toronto is it's a beautiful city. I, I highly encourage people when when things open up again uh, to visit. Summers are absolutely incredible and our skyline is punctuated by uh, this big structure here, the CN Tower, which was up until very recently the tallest freestanding structure in the world. Now I practice in a small city, I guess you'd call it a small city called Aurora, which is about in American terms, about 20 miles north of the Toronto city limits. So it's still sort of considered part of the greater Toronto area. What I love about Aurora is that it's, it's got a great mix of established and newer families. And it is uh, one of the fastest growing cities to towns uh, in, in and around Toronto. Uh, it's just close enough that you still have access to all the big city events, but far enough that you don't have to deal with a lot of the, a lot of the irritating annoyances of being in the big city. Um, we are the only periodontal practice in the entire city of Aurora. And there's four of us uh, that all went to school together, all went to Toronto, University of Toronto together, did our specialization uh, at University of Toronto. And uh, it's a really nice setup we have a faithful base of referring dentists that are all dedicated to their craft, um, excellent what they're at and refer everything else out. Uh, so it's nice to have those relationships, particularly for uh, growing with these referrals with time as well. We have about 15 staff and, and, we've, and, and it seems to grow uh, from year to year. Mm -hmm. and, and the patient population, um, you know, you, you obviously get uh, or at least I'm assuming, you know, you have a good referral base from all of the surrounding areas. Uh, 
can you give us just a little basis of the demographic, socioeconomic, uh, you know, the, the, the patient population that you mostly see? So Aurora is uh, a mixed bag in terms of uh, demographics and ethnicities and, and cultural backgrounds. So it's nice because we get to see people from, from all walks of life and, and all different parts of the world. Uh, fun fact about Aurora is that in my province of Ontario, it is um, one of two cities that has the highest per capita income uh, in, in Ontario. And so we're dealing with, um, I, I would say, an above average population in terms of in terms of affluence. Um, so we're really able to provide the ideal treatment to our patients and not have to worry so much about whether someone has the means to afford the treatment uh, or not. Um, it's it's uh, in the sense of our referrals, they do a great job of preparing the patients for their treatment with us. So basically by the time a patient sees me, I'm just rubber stamping um, the consult and the patient's like, when do you want to start doc? All right, let's get you in tomorrow or a week from now. And that actually raises a, you know, you're actually heading into my script a few questions down, but what are some of the things that you have done, what the practice has done to set up that relationship with the referrals to, because patient acceptance of soft tissue procedures is not always commonplace. So it, it does require some good engagement with the, the, the general practitioners in the area. What kind of things do you do to outreach to the referral base in your community? So we, we've essentially taken a three-pronged approach. Uh, one is that we have a study club that's ongoing uh, throughout the year where we have our 15 to 20 biggest referrals um, and, and we meet, we, we, have a, we have a lecture, we have a dinner, and we talk about various topics related to interdisciplinary care. And usually one of us will, one of the periodontists will give a presentation on some aspect of the periodontal therapy that's being discussed in that study club meeting. We also reach out to the hygienists. We have a hygienist study club. So maybe once every quarter, or every, every six months, we have the hygienists come in and we give them a lecture or a presentation on some aspect of periodontal therapy, which they can relate to, which is applicable to their practice. And hygienists are the best crowd to lecture to because they're so eager to learn uh, and they're, they're jotting notes furiously. But a lot of our referrals actually come because the hygienist saw our lecture at our study club meeting and tell their principal dentist, hey, I want to send this to so-and-so uh, for this problem. Uh, last but not least, when it comes to soft tissue, educating your referrals about what is possible. Because a lot of times we come out of dental school not really knowing that there are some really solid options for, for treating gingival recession. Um, gone are the days when we were just trying to prevent recession from getting worse. Now we can actually reverse the clock, if you will, on these, on these recession defects. We teach our referring dentists about different types of recession. What are the etiological factors? What are the treatments? What is their success? What is their predictability? How do we classify and diagnose recession so that they can have all these conversations to prime their patients before they see us? When the patient sees me, they already know what I'm gonna be talking to them about and treatment acceptance as a result is a lot higher because of that. Mm -hmm. So I, just as, as we proceed into the conversation, you know, one of the things that we talked about uh, previously was just looking at some of the people that have been inspirational in your career and people that um, you, know, you look to for education, that when they're on the, uh, the, the docket in terms of uh, speakers, you say, okay, I'm gonna make sure to make that one. So we put together a quick slide just to highlight some of those individuals. And maybe you can talk to them as individuals and, and maybe express what some of the things that they've done for you in your career. For sure. So, um, you know, mentors are, are many. And uh, if I had to pick five people really that have had the most impact on my career, it would be these five gentlemen here, Dr. Urban, Dr. Boozer, Dr. Link Vicious, Zucchelli, and Dr. Skoulian. And each of them has provided me with some insight that I've applied in my own daily practice. And what I appreciate about all these individuals is that they're not all over the map. They each have really, really perfected a technique or a concept, and they've pursued it relentlessly over the course of 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Urban, um, he's known for his prowess and finesse with vertical augmentation procedures. 15 years ago, when we talked to patients about 
vertical augmentation, the standard line was, yeah, it's not very predictable. Maybe we'll get two or three millimeters of vertical augmentation. And over the years, Dr. Urban has stuck to his technique. He's believed in it. And now he's probably the most sought out after clinician in terms of learning his technique. Um, and, and so it's that sort of belief and relentless pursuit of a particular technique uh, that appeals to me. Uh, Dr. Linka Vicious and his zero bone loss concepts uh, idea really speaks to me in terms of the clinician placing a large number of implants on a yearly basis. Uh, what are the factors that can help reduce the risk of prestal bone loss and thereby prevent periimplantitis? And the fact that he's really drawn attention to the importance of soft tissue in helping to prevent crustal bone loss. It's not just all about the bone anymore, right? There's a lot of impact of the soft tissue. Uh, Dr. Skoulian's work with regenerative therapies has influenced me greatly. As a periodontist, I'm all about saving teeth. And if, if I didn't have to do implants in my private practice, I'd actually be a very happy periodontist because it's a lot more forgiving when you're trying to save teeth. And we know that teeth can be saved even in compromised states. But Dr. Skoulian's work on enamel matrix derivatives has, has really been a game changer for me over my career. Dr. Zucchelli, we all know, is a soft tissue guru. I, I had the opportunity recently to go to Italy in middle of February before all this pandemic stuff hit the fan and do a three-day hands-on course with Professor Zucchelli in his private practice with 15, 20 other international clinicians. And again, he has a technique that he's innovated and just relentlessly pursued and published and has shown that it is quite predictable, not only in his hands, but in other people's hands as well, because replicability is a very, very important concept. A lot of times we take courses and we get all excited, come back home only to realize that we can't reproduce what these people taught us on, on stage. Um, Dr. Boozer, um, the concept of delayed immediate implant placement was something that I learned about at the ITI con Congress in New York in 2007. Um, and that changed my view as well about timing of implant placement. And so these are just small snippets of what these gentlemen have done for me. Um, and I've never had an opportunity to tell them in person um, what, what they mean to me or my career, but really they um, have influenced me so profoundly and to this day continue. And it you know, you bring up an interesting point just about, you know, these are the at the top of the pantheon of uh, clinicians that you look to. And, and but but help me with the, the concept of when you're going to an educational course and the differences between listening to, to this type of clinician versus those clinicians that you listen to and you say, I can repeat this every single day. This is everyday dentistry. It feels more connected to the way in which I practice. Do you feel connected to what they're doing? Or do you feel as though you're modifying things that fit your needs? And how, like even today, how do you plan on communicating to everybody around the world that'll be listening about the way in which you practice your techniques and procedures? So of course, we, we always look to the evidence and we always look to the literature for guidance. And if we can replicate someone else's technique and get good success and predictability with it, then, then more power to us. But the reality is that we all have our own philosophies and mindsets. And I think at this point in my career, I'm picking up little bits and pieces from these various individuals that enhance what I'm already doing. So for example, with Dr. Urban, I may not use the exact membrane or the bone grafting material that he uses in his technique, but certainly the principles that he talks about for let's say lingual flap release to get tension-free closure or suturing principles, I may incorporate in my own bone grafting procedures, even though I might use a different membrane or I might use different particulate uh, materials. With, with, with Dr. Zucchelli, um, I might modify the technique a little bit uh, to, to, to suit my, my own experience because it's not like we haven't been successful uh, either. And one of the things I wanna conv uh, convey to, to the audience today when I give my lecture is that um, as an early adopter of a particular technique, um, we're essentially flying blind um, and we're using our own experiences to guide us and, and figure out a way for ourselves. And this is what makes these guys so special is because they've sort of figured out a way when no one else had that concept uh, before them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
So I, just quickly transitioning, uh, you know, as we had mentioned before, this is a preview conversation to the, um, this is actually the afternoon session on the February 2nd uh, that will be recorded. There actually is an earlier version as well uh, with some different speakers that will be, they, that um, have already presented, but all of this is recorded. Um, but you can see Dr. Bidet is part of the schedule here. Um, but I wanted to take this as an opportunity before, and I know we had talked about getting into some of the cases and, and maybe I'll, I'll just click to the next slide, which is a little bit of a preview of your case. But I wanted to ask a question that is very much related to what you were talking about before about setting expectations with patients. As you know, and, and as we've highlighted here that pallet free is something of, um, uh, of great interest and in whether or not you would look at your practice as, is it a pallet free practice? And you've expressed that, you know, connective tissue grafts, free gingival grafts are still go-to techniques for you. But you've highlighted in the past in conversations that you've started to experiment with materials and fiber guide is one that you had experimented with. So can you talk to me a little bit about your experiences with experimenting with fiber guide and I guess another really important question that I have for the audience is what really made you decide to jump? What made you say, I can do this here or there? What enabled you not to just say, I have to find the perfect case? What made you just start to move forward and say, I can succeed here and this is a good place to start? Wow, so lots to unpack there, Ron, and I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so first of all, I, I don't know if any practice, uh, very few practices I'd say are, are purely palate free. Um, I mean, certainly in, in our earlier discussions, I've, I've intimated to you that I'm still the majority of my cases for soft tissue grafting involve autogenous tissue. And as much as I love the procedures and I love the technique, I hate going to the palate. Like I really, like I, I brace myself every single time because maybe I'll get a phone call two days later that there is a bleeding that's uncontrollable or the patient's having a lot of pain from the healing of the palatal wound. And so as an ideal, the challenge that I think we all have as perios or, or surgical practitioners, or even the dream that I see is maybe one day we'll never have to go to the palate. Like I would, I would love that day to happen where I can say to the patient, look them in the eye, confidently say, we do not have to take your own gum tissue. We can get a great result, both in the short and long-term using a substitute or an alternative. And I think that we're getting closer and closer. Perhaps we'll see that in my, in my practice lifetime. Um, so as far as being an early adopter fiber guide, I, I, I like being an early adopter in general of technologies and devices that make sense to me from, from a clinical standpoint. And I've not had the best results with the first generation collagen matrices or the dermal matrix products, uh, allograft products that are out there on the market. Everything looks great in the short term, six months, maybe a year. And then you get back the patient for the one year follow up and things have retracted a little bit. The tissue doesn't look as great. Um, you really feel that you haven't done this patient much a service. And then of course you say, well, if I'd only used autogenous tissue, maybe I would have been able to avoid this. When I first came across FiberGuide, it, it stood out to me because of the fact that it had this property of volume stability. And when we're doing root coverage procedures, we're not just looking to cover the root, we're also aiming to change the phenotype, i.e. the thickness of the gingival tissue, the keratinized tissue width. And so for a matrix like this, where it maintains its volume and its thickness, that made sense to me. And I thought to myself, hey, we could be onto something pretty big here. Let me try this. On, on, on a few of my patients. And so the conversation I had with my patients essentially went like this. Um, I can do, I can use your own gum tissue or I could use a substitute tissue. At this point, I don't think that my results with the substitute tissue is going to be any worse than your recession is at this point. And worst case scenario, if I'm not happy with the result, if you're not happy with the result, I can always go back and use your own gum tissue and I'm not gonna charge you for this because I really wanna do what's best for you. I'm not looking at this as a cash grab, um, but at the same time, I want the satisfaction of knowing that I've tried something new and if it works and if it works well, then the patient has the satisfaction of not having their palate uh, cut into and all the other morbidities that go, go into that. 
Um, and so that's why I decided to make the jump. It's because there, my gut told me that there's something about this particular matrix that is different from the other products that are out there. And when you're talking about the patient acceptance, I mean, we've talked previously about patient reported outcomes. Do you find that this leads to greater patient acceptance, greater experience, greater referrals? Is it communicated? Are you referring doctors saying things like, you know, that you left them in a good place? How, how has this influenced your relationship with patients and referrals? So my relationship with referrals um, has been positively influenced. Um, they, uh, they're happy with the way their patients come back to them and the feedback that they get from their patients saying this patient, this procedure was painless. I was able to go back to work the next day and didn't have to worry about any bleeding or any discomfort from the roof of my mouth. Uh, and so they're happy with that. And they'll call me and ask me more about, okay, what exactly did you do? What is this material? I've never heard of this before. So that leads to another conversation and, and more referral education. On the patient side, I think they're very grateful when they see a good result and, uh, and we don't have to cause them the pain and discomfort. Anecdotally, what I've found is that the patient acceptance for this particular product, i.e. the fiber guide, is more than with the dermal matrix allograft because the dermal matrix allograft is, is, is a transplant. And as soon as I say this is from someone else's, the back of someone's thigh, um, all of a sudden you see that Oh my gosh, are you sure, sure, am I sure that I really want this in my mouth? Whereas the xenograft aspect of this particular device, it is a device, it's not a transplant, the fiber guide. Uh, there's no risk of communicable disease and it's not a transplanted tissue. And I think that when I explain the differences like that to the patient, the acceptance for a xenograft product or xenogenic product is typically greater when it comes to these matrices than the typical allograft dermal matrix. Good. So why don't we take this opportunity to transition to some of the cases. Now we were going to start with a little bit of a preview. You're going to talk a, a lot about root coverage during your presentation, um, but you're going to have to move quickly through it. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for you to give maybe a little bit of backstory. I mean, you've already talked about experimenting, excuse me, experimenting with the materials. This was really one of your earlier cases. And yes. that shows with nice, nice long-term results in, in your hands. But can you give a little bit of a backdrop and just for everybody's um, knowledge, I'm gonna be advancing the slide. So if you hear Dr. Biday saying next, that's gonna be my cue to load up the next slide. Perfect, so uh, yes, this you're absolutely right, Ron. This is one of my first cases that I used FiberGuide for. And the backstory for this patient, the young gentleman in his late 20s, pilot for a commercial airline. And, you know, there are some professions that really don't have the luxury of downtime. And I think being a commercial airline pilot that's on a fixed schedule, limited days off is one of those professions. And so when I spoke to this patient about the options of uh, getting root coverage, he was more interested in his premolar tooth, which had a little bit more recession. Um, I of course, present every patient with the autogenous option. Um, and then, of course, we go over the pros and cons. And I did say to him, I said, listen, I cannot tell you for sure that you're going to be back flying in a few days. Um, the pain from the roof of your mouth could be variable. Different patients respond very differently. However, I, I've just learned about this new product that's been on the market for maybe a month, month and a half uh, that uh, has really good promise. Would you be open to trying that? The benefit to you is that if it works, then we would have saved you a trip to the pallet. And it's not going to give you a whole lot of downtime such that you'll be able to have all your wits about you when you're carrying the responsibility of 250 lives in your hands when you're getting on a plane every single day, right? Um, and so we did, uh, and admittedly, this is a very ideal case to start off with. The patient has RT1 recession defects, so they're amenable to complete root coverage. Uh, nice thick zone of keratinized tissue, at least a couple of millimeters. So I really cherry picked this case. I'm not gonna lie. Many time you're trying out a new material, you wanna make sure you've sort of stacked the odds in your favor somewhat. And, and, and so I expected that I would get a good result with this case. Did I expect that at two years, the result would still be looking really, really good? I didn't know because there was nothing in the literature at that point when I first started using this uh, to suggest a long-term outcome. So I was, I was very surprised when I saw this patient back and I, I hadn't seen this patient 
following his two week postdoc because him being a pilot just didn't have the time to come in for his postdoc for the visits. So last week I had in preparation for this event today, I had my office track him down uh, and I figured because it's COVID, he's grounded, no pun intended, that um, that he can come in. He came in for the follow up, and I was I was blown away. It was it was always nicer to see when you haven't seen someone in about two, close to two years. Wow, this is a really good result. And he was happy because there's no more sensitivity, um, no more aesthetic concerns, and the result was nice, stable, and healthy. Mm -hmm. and, and can you talk about uh, just w whether in this case or just in your experience so far with uh, these materials about feeling? The aesthetics, color match, any complications, any favorability? How would you compare this to other treatments? Well, healing was really nice. I mean, you can see at the two years how stable that tissue is. The color is nice and pink and healthy. Um, but the short-term healing that I've seen at one week and two weeks, um, it's uh, it's pretty interesting because what this material is, it's, it's, it's a volume-stable collagen matrix, and it's weekly chemically cross-linked. So it is able to imbibe a lot of the patient's blood and fluid. And so when I bring the patients back at one and two weeks, the area where I've treated with FibroGuide is sitting is, is pretty red and pretty swollen. But that's a good thing because we know that that material is, is holding the blood and the blood clot in the area and will turn over into, into new tissue. Um, as far as post-operative morbidities, Usually only it's the bruising and the bruising doesn't hurt, uh, but pain wise, very little, very little to any pain. Typical response I'd get from a patient is I had to take one Tylenol 2 or one Tylenol 3 or a couple of Advil or ibuprofen. And I was pleasantly surprised with how little pain I had because the majority of the discomfort from these procedures comes from the palate. And if we're getting rid of the palate, uh, taking that out of the equation, then really it's, it's, a, it's a very low morbidity procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I, I think you have uh, the next slide really kind of shows two other <clears throat> cases that you wanted to uh, show, or I, I'm not sure if you're talking about them during the presentation, but uh, we'll go to these as well. Maybe you can talk to these. Sure. Yeah, so I wanted to, to whet the appetite a little bit. Um, these are the two cases that I'll be featuring um, at my talk in, in a couple of hours. And again, these were a couple of my earlier cases that, that I used FiberGuide for. And uh, once again, uh, the reasons for using FibroGuide were the patient on the left, case number one, had a history of um, a traumatic experience using autogenous tissue when she was in her teenage years. And so she came to the consult before I even had a chance to speak to her and said, if you're going to tell me that I have to use my own gum tissue, then I don't want to do this procedure. Okay, so we already know what type of patient we're dealing with there. The second guy, case number two, is a young guy in his late 20s biomedical engineer, and, uh, and we were having conversations about technological advances and biomedical engineering, and I just happened to mention to him uh, about the guys to the fiber guide but that I'd just been introduced to maybe a month earlier, and, and he was pretty fascinated by it because of the fact that I, I showed him that it was volume stable, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and he's like, hey, I'd love, to, I'd love for you to, to use this on me, um, and uh, I'd, I'd rather not have the roof of my mouth uh, incised into um, so that's about all I'll say about these cases because um, I go over the surgical technique in detail uh, during my presentation. But suffice to say that I've got one and a half year follow-ups for both of these cases. And if this Congress was two or three weeks later, I would have had a two-year follow-up for case number one as well. Um, and I think you'll be happy with uh, with what you see. I certainly was. So you like to be a pioneer and you've taken on this material and started, but you didn't stop there. You know, you looked at it and said, what else can I do? And it seems like that is, and maybe I should ask you just out front, is that something that you look to do? I mean, so many clinicians look for just a consistent procedure, rinse and repeat, keep on doing the same thing. You seem to uh, experiment looking for ways to optimize. Is that is that you or is it, um, you know, do you think that's emblematic of other clinicians in the community? Um, I, I'd like to think that other clinicians are, to some degree, trying to tweak their technique here and there. Um, I've always been, um, I would say, like a, a research-minded guy, and, and I never went into a full-time academic career. Um, I'm full-time in private practice, but I always think about these things because I'm always thinking about how can I make this better. And, and this is where the inspiration from people like Zucchelli and Urban, Dr. Zucchelli and Dr. Urban come in, 
is because I can see even with them over the years, they've been modifying their technique or finding new applications um, for, for, or indications for expanding the use of their, their technique. Uh, but for this particular material, um, it made a lot of sense to me to use in areas other than just root coverage because of the physical and mechanical properties uh, that it has. And, um, and at the end of the day, like I just, you know, we're all creatures of habit. We all like to some degree the rinse and repeat philosophy, but if we can rinse and repeat maybe a little bit quicker, but more efficiently um, without the frustrations that we see from previous methodologies, then why not, right? Um, that's why it's called practice, right? It's not called perfect because there's always um, some element of, of, uh, of experimentation, uh, legitimate experimentation, like you're not using your patients as guinea pigs, of course, there's certain ethics that we all have to uh, subscribe to, but within the limits of what biologically makes sense, um, I'm in the last couple of years, especially, I'm trying to push the envelope, but, but in a way that's still keeping the patient's best interest at heart. Yeah. Well, and now's a great opportunity. You provided me some additional cases that you wanted to, to show off different indications for use. And we'll, we'll spend most of the remaining time going through those cases. And, and you can expand on them a little further because they won't be part of the lecture uh, as part of the Geisick in your presentation. So you utilize the product, uh, Geisick Fiber Guide again for contour deficiencies around implants. And please set up the case and, and what you experienced. Young lady in her mid thirties um, had this implant placed uh, by another clinician about a year before she came to see me. And we can see here that uh, we have a, a huge marginal discrepancy of the gum line around the anterior implant compared to the natural teeth. And the patient rightfully so wasn't happy about this, about this result. Um, good looking lady with a high smile line and was very conscious of, of this. And she was told that it could be restored perhaps with pink porcelain uh, or ceramics to, to mask that, but she wasn't satisfied with that. She wanted to know if something else uh, could be done. And this is how she presented to me. Um, and usually when you see discrepancies like this, it's because the implant is placed either too deep and or too far out buccally. And as we know, the gingiva, the gum line, will follow the architecture of the bone. Uh, so at that point, I thought to myself, okay, we have to do some augmentation uh, procedure. So what we did was we uh, removed, um, we didn't remove the healing abutment. In, retros in retrospect, I probably should have done that, but it didn't matter in the final result. Uh, but we decided to do an augmentation procedure where I said to her, I said, listen, we can use this new material, fiber guide, which is, a volume stable material that we can use to augment this area, let it heal for a few months and go back in to do the uncovery procedure. And so we can see here the occlusal, uh, the buccal view and the occlusal view. Her gingival thickness is actually fairly decent, um, but I wanted to improve it even more uh, to see if we can even get some vertical augmentation as well uh, of, of the gums so that we have something to work with when we do the uncovery surgery. Um, you can go to the next slide, Bob. So we start with uh, our split thickness recipient site preparation. Uh, we can see that we've left the periosteum um, onto the bone here. I've made vertical releases uh, remotely so that we're not uh, right on the material when we're closing. And I like to hydrate the fiber guide prior to use. There's about a 25 to 30% volumetric expansion of this material. And what I want, my rationale, is that I want this material at its maximum expansion because then I can control it. If I put this in dry, then whatever expansion occurs after the fact, when the patient goes home, could potentially compromise healing because we want there to be really no movement or, or no tension on that buckle flap uh, whatsoever. So we can go to the I next slide. A, yeah. a quick question here. Sure. I'm always curious about the decision-making process with regards to whether you look to augment bone or soft tissue, at what ratio, in what indications. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps a case like this and say where it was or was not indicated to augment bone as well? And what is your rationale for doing either procedure? 
Um, so in a case like this, uh, where the majority, of the, the majority of the implant appears to be in bone with the exception of maybe a small thread exposure here, um, in this particular case, I think soft tissue augmentation uh, would suffice. Uh, there's a paper that came out by, by Zucchelli's group last year looking at peri-implant soft tissue dehiscences. And, um, and based on the preoperative presentation for this patient, I would just think a soft tissue augmentation would suffice. If there was more of a buccal bony dehiscence, then we'd probably do uh, a combined hard and soft tissue augmentation, uh, which in that case, I would probably either do a GBR um, or I would do uh, bone grafting in conjunction with an autogenous graft uh, to provide some thickness and, and, and phenotype modification. But in a case like this, where really I'm just looking to try and enhance the soft tissue, because at this point, I'm not gonna be able to grow the bone any more vertically than it is. I mean, that little area that you see that's exposed, who knows what's gonna happen if I put bone on there. It's really the soft tissue in this case uh, that I'm trying to, to manage. The implant was buccal, but it wasn't so far buccal that we had to uh, do bone grafting in this particular case. And just um, as, before I advance to the next slide, I just wanna use this opportunity to remind people if they do wish to ask any questions, please utilize the chat function and we'll have somebody, and we should have a few moments at the end to answer any questions that you might have. So as we advance to the next slide. Yeah. So here we can see that I've uh, placed the, the, the fiber guide in full thickness. I've maybe trimmed the edges here a little bit so that we can fit it between the two teeth. And what you see, if you look on the, on the buccal view, uh, you'll see the thin sutures that I've used to help secure uh, this material in place. Because not only are we placing it on the buckle, we're actually wrapping it around uh, to the occlusal aspect uh, as well. So immobilization uh, in this case is very, very important. But you can get an appreciation of how thick that material is. It's almost obscenely thick. And I was worried, I was like, how the, he how the heck am I going to get closure uh, over, over this material? Um, but we persevered and we were able uh, to get uh, closure, and we will we'll see that on the next slide. Well, as you're going into this, I just want to highlight maybe in, or talk through the procedure a little bit. Mm -hmm. It appears as though you've you've been very diligent to save the adjacent papillae. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the surgical depth or how far you wanted to go apically. Have you ever had any issues with apical creep with fiber guide as it goes backwards? How do you think it heals, or do you need to keep it? that secure in place? Um, I think securing any matrix or any material, any scaffolding type of material is, is necessary um, because we can't control what happens after we let the patient go home. Um, any micro motion can cause a catastrophic healing uh, for this patient. So uh, here I want to make sure that this material stayed where I wanted it because getting, getting coverage of the occlusal was also paramount to augment the vertical height uh, for this uh, patient. So I almost always, whether in root coverage or whether in these types of situations, um, will secure this uh, material. Now, there are certain situations where I'm just looking to augment the buckle, where I can raise a conservative flap on the buckle and tuck in the fiber guide, in which case it doesn't need to be secured. But in a case like this, where I'm looking for more of a three-dimensional augmentation, um, securing it is, is paramount, in, in my humble opinion. Excellent. All right, we'll keep going. So we persevered and I was able to get closure um, over the material, but not complete closure. So you can see on the occlusal view that I had to bite the bullet a little bit and leave this uh, material exposed. And this was the first case that I'd used this material for in this particular indication. So I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit concerned because again, I, I had no idea about the dynamics of this material if left exposed. Um, and particularly, it, it's, a, it's a relatively large exposure. This is not just a small one millimeter exposure. This is about a three to five millimeter exposure um, width-wise and length-wise. Uh, but at this point, I really couldn't get any more release and I didn't want now to go to the palate and harvest an autogenous tissue to, just to cover that up. So I said, hey, let's, let's see what happens um, and brought the patient back in at one week because my curiosity uh, got the best of me. And so I'll share that in my next slide. Yeah. And j just for clarity, uh, the product is indicated as, a, as part of closed procedures, but that, as you had mentioned, not always possible. And as you had also said, 
there could be catastrophic failure, especially if you're utilizing other biomaterials to potentially leave in an exposed situation. That's right. And, and also with these materials, if you leave them exposed, particularly with the weak cross-linkage of this material, I expect that it would also degrade perhaps at a faster rate um, if it's left exposed. So that's also another concern. But at this point, I really had no choice. I was relying on my, my closure elsewhere and, and preservation of blood supply um, to, to help this material through. Excellent. And so at one week, I called the patient back. And to, to your point, Ron, uh, to answer this more in detail, um, look at the healing at one week. Um, there's very little inflammation. This material is highly biocompatible and elicits a very minimal uh, to no inflammatory response. I mean, the inflammatory response you see really is where I've tied off my, my chromic gut sutures, but everywhere else where I've used polypropylene, um, there really is a very minimal to no inflammatory response. And you could probably appreciate the gum line, how much lower it is coronally than it was in the preoperative photo. So I see, I see this and I'm very, very happy. More importantly, over the area where that material was left exposed, it looks like it's, it's actually healing. And we can also see a contour conversion happening here as well on, on the buccal aspect. So um, maybe, I got, maybe I got lucky in this case, the patient was healthy, non-smoking, did exactly what we told her to do, but maybe this material does have a little bit of room if it has to be left exposed that it's not going to damage the healing uh, for, for the duration of the healing. I saw the patient back at four months, and this was uh, pre-COVID, um, not sorry, not pre-COVID, at, at four months. And this is where we're at now. Um, we've been trying to get a hold of the patient to come in for the uncovery um, and have not been successful yet in doing so. But I think overall, we've managed to really get a nice result for this patient um, with good conversion of the contour. We've got good healing of, of, of the ridge coronally. We have nice keratinized tissue. Um, but we've also been able to effectively lower the gum line. So now at stage two, if I'm careful and use um, a, a technique which helps me to preserve as much tissue as we can, like the palatal roll technique or something to that effect, um, and, then have the temp and then have the patient in serial temporary crown restorations, I think we'll be able to really get a nice result for this patient. Um, we've already gotten off to a great start, um, and now it's just a matter of bringing it home. But this is just the fiber guide uh, alone. Once again, palate free approach. The normal approach in this situation would have been doing a VIP, uh, vascularized interpositional uh, connective tissue graft, which is also, of course, associated with pain and discomfort. So I'm very, very happy with that. And perhaps if I have another indication to use it in this scenario, I'll have that much more confidence that it could work. And maybe I'll try and get even more closure over, over the area. But, but maybe not having closure over the area could have actually been a blessing in disguise because it allowed for good development of keratinized tissue here over the cover screw. So I, I have to pull my little sales head on for a second and uh, use the line, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so you didn't just stop there with your techniques and your investigation with the product and you have provided me another case that you have just recently started to work on and found some really interesting results. So let's transition to the next case. Oh, excuse me, I didn't. Huh. Oh, right. so, so, so let, let's just finish off on this. So you, you can Over see there. the difference between preoperative and four months. Um, like it's, it's a pretty night and day difference, I would say. And I anticipate that when I see this patient back and she finally returns, um, you know, she's got a young family with young kids and everyone's at home right now because of COVID. Um, but when we were able to get her back into the office, I anticipate that this area, um, at the buckle may heal even more. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to documenting this case further. Excellent. Now I can use my line. Now wait, <laughs> but wait there's more. <laughs> yeah. All right, next case, sorry. So right. you asked the question, can fiber guide be used for periodontal regeneration? I did, and, and I have to say, this was not my idea. Um, I, I looked to one of my mentors um, for, for, for getting this idea and having the courage uh, to try this in an indication that otherwise has never been tried. And, and this is Professor Anton Skoulian. Um, I had the privilege of hearing him lecture uh, at the Ontario Society of Periodontists meeting uh, just over a year ago. And he was presenting uh, data on regeneration 
Fernal regeneration. And he just mentioned, and, I, and, I, and he didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, but he said that his lab right now is working, right now meaning in November of 2019, is working on using fiber guide infused with enamel matrix derivative um, as a means for obtaining periodontal regeneration. So you're using the fiber guide as essentially a carrier for the enamel matrix derivative. And at the same time, because of its volumetric expansion, it can help to support the flap. And, and I caught it, and none of my none of my colleagues really latched onto that, but I latched onto it, and I approached them after the talk, and I said, "Hey, I'm really interested in this and pursuing this further. Is there any opportunity to work together?" And so we said, "You know what? I just just document your cases, and um, and then we'll 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 go back and forth. And this is the protocol, and this is what you want to do in terms of the technique, in terms of the post-operative medications, etc." And so this was one of my first cases. Uh, this gentleman uh, presented to me with, uh, you can see this redness and inflammation at the mesial aspect of the upper left canine, tooth number six. Radiographically, you can see this moderate depth intrabony defect. And certainly when we're probing, you can, you can see the probe extend at least eight to nine millimeters. Um, and so of course we put this patient through conventional non-surgical therapy, but with limited benefit. And we decided at that point that a surgical approach uh, should be should be employed. Um, so I was very excited because this is something I never shared with anybody. Um, I just said, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, I recognized at that time it was probably off-label use. But once again, going back to the whole thing about biologically when something makes sense and what do we want for regenerative therapy? We want a protected space for a blood clot to form. And then that blood clot will then mature into what we hope to be periodontal ligament, cement, and, and alveolar bone. So uh, we elevated our flap and debrided the defect after some good thorough scaling and root planing. And we can see that there's a, a considerable depth to the defect. It's almost seven or eight millimeters. And the radiograph doesn't quite help you appreciate how deep that defect is because the fact that apically this was more of a three wall defect and coronally closer to a two wall defect. So um, a three wall defect is fairly predictable but a two wall defect is, is mixed in terms of its regenerative predictability. So the key here is to debride the defect, thoroughly scale and root plane the affected root surfaces. And then we get our fiber guide in its dry state. And one thing I'll, I'll mention right off the top is handling this material is much easier in its dry state. So whatever you want to do to this material, do it dry before you hydrate it. Because once it's hydrated, it, it's not the easiest material to, to manipulate and handle. So I cut up the fiber guide into small little pieces and mix them with uh, endogain enamel matrix derivative and let it just infuse for a few minutes, much like steeping my tea every morning. And then we condition the root with uh, pref gel or EDTA for a couple, couple of minutes before we irrigate thoroughly with saline. I always like to apply a little bit of leftover endogain or enamel matrix derivative to the, um, to the root surface, just to prime uh, the root surface. And then we can start filling this defect. Let's go to the next slide, Ron. Uh, we can start filling this defect with these uh, endogame infused pieces of fiber guide. Um, and no sooner that as we put these pieces into the defect, uh, you can see that expansion uh, right away. So that's why I cut it up into, into pieces that are no more than three or four millimeters uh, by three or four millimeters. Um, and we packed this. It only, take, it only took me a few pieces of fiber guide to fill this defect. Then of course we need to get good tension-free primary closure, which we'll see in our next slide. Um, this patient needed surgery in the, the, in the entire quadrant, but only regenerative therapy uh, for the canine. So we can see uh, a 4-0 a PTFE suture used in a continuous sling fashion to completely close over the surgical area. Now, I had the pleasure of seeing this patient very recently for their six month follow-up. And when I probed the area, the probing depth was maybe four millimeters. Considering that we started off with uh, about eight to nine millimeters of probing preoperatively and a preoperative uh, and a probing bony, uh, probing of the bony defect of about seven, eight millimeters, I was pretty happy that at six months we were already at four millimeters. And I think that there's still considerable room for it to improve further. But when we look at the radiograph, uh, we can see compared to the preoperative that we've actually gotten some bone regeneration here. And remember, there is no bone particles put in this defect at all. It was just 
a fiber guide matrix infused with enamel matrix derivative. So what you're seeing here is real bone, de novo bone formation. And I expect that when I see the patient back in three months or four months, that maybe this bone will look even better um, and have mineralized even more. So it'll be interesting to follow this case. And I've got probably four or five more cases like this in various stages of healing. And so far from a healing perspective for the patient, as well as um, a radiographic uh, and clinical perspective, things are, are pretty promising. And I think, um, as you shared with me, Schoolian, uh, Dr. Schoolian just came out with a, with a preclinical study looking at uh, this particular technique in, in beagle dogs as a proof of principle. Um, so I'm kind of happy that I have uh, decent data already in, in the, on the human side of things. And are you happy with where the bone fill stands today as compared to the adjacent teeth? I am, I am. I think that uh, I wouldn't have expected a better result using just an animal matrix derivative by itself or even using a bone filler. Bone fillers look great on radiographs, but how much of this attachment is actually real? We don't know. What I'm happiest about is that this is actual bone formation um, and bone takes about eight or nine months to heal. This is actually a, probably a preliminary radiograph and I expect that maybe at the nine month healing point, there'll be more mineralization, perhaps even more vertical um, increase in bone height as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, listen, we are getting really close to our uh, ending and I wanted to thank you very much for participating in this conversation. Uh, there was one question that came in asking about that second case and it said, in retrospect on that case, do you think you could have released more to get primary closure and not leave it exposed? You know, hindsight being 2020, of course, in retrospect, if I had gone maybe a little bit deeper, released a little bit more, I may have gotten primary closure. Um, part of the difficulty in getting primary closure was the fact that there was this big void there from where that healing button was. What I probably should have done is remove the healing abutment and let the uh, soft tissue naturally grow over a cover screw for about six weeks before going in and doing this procedure, then I would have for sure gotten primary closure and may not have affected the vestibule. To try and stretch that flap the way it was to get really primary, a good primary closure, I would have obliterated the vestibule. Um, and then that also carries with it uh, different problems that we have to address later on. Excellent. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Bide. Uh, this was an excellent conversation. And just as a reminder for everybody, he will be one of the leading speakers as part of the, uh, the virtual Congress that is uh, starting up in just a few moments. Remember that this is both live and also recorded, so you can go to this at a later date and view everything, including this conversation. Again, Dr. Bidet, on behalf of all of us at Geislick, thank you so much. And... Um, Break a leg. You'll do great during this uh, Congress upcoming. Uh, break a leg over breaking my mouse or my screen, right? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ron. I really appreciate this opportunity um, for this fantastic discussion. I hope that uh, people were able to see Fiber Guide in, a, in perhaps a different light and uh, maybe um, they'll be inspired to, to use this in, in their, uh, on their patients in various clinical indications as well. Thanks so much. That's a great way to end. You be well, take care, well. stay warm, and you we'll too. talk soon. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining.